Good. Um, so um, all the other exciting talks you're going to hear about today are going to be what's come out of the Modern Code Project in terms of interesting scientific discoveries. And um, my job is to, is to represent the Data Coordination Consortium, which did the data herding part of the uh, operation and tell you about how to get at the data. So this is a talk about the data, not, um, not uh, about the scientific results from it. And so, <clears throat> Uh, the, as, as Elise pointed out, there was, there was something like 10 data production groups, but in fact behind that there was something like 50 labs producing data and hundreds of people doing it. And so one of the things that the NHGRI was very keen on was that in spite of the fact that there were a very large number of people producing the, the data, the data would be produced according to uh, well-defined standards and that they would be um, uniformly annotated, the data would be curated in a nice way and therefore usable in the long term. And thinking about what Eric said about the human genome, it's, it's quite, in some senses, sense, it's quite simple to represent a human genome. It's one nice, simple flat file with TCs, Gs, As, and Ns in it. And uh, to, to represent uh, features on that is pretty easy as well because they're just start and end points on, on, on chromosomes. But the type and range of data that, that you're going to see later here uh, are altogether more complicated. And although those data can end up in well-defined public repositories, the idea was that there would be one highly um, curated, coherent whole, one location where you could find the data and it would be uh, of a uniform standard. And that was the, the purpose of the data uh, co coordination center. So um, some of the people within the data coordination center were known as wranglers and they were assigned to the different data production groups and uh, they helped the uh, data production groups submit their data and importantly metadata relating to all of the experiments to the DCC. Now the metadata are the, the bits of information about the experiment, whether it was done on a fly or a worm and whether it was done at what developmental stage and under what temperature and what other conditions. And in order to take these uh, very complex data sets and be able to use them truly in the longer term, it's important to have very good metadata in, in, a, very, in a very rigorous way. Uh, even though that can be a, a kind of painful process to, uh, to, to, uh, to derive it. So the DCC's job was to uh, accept the data and the metadata, perform quality control checks and vet it, and then release it to the public. And uh, on release, it would end up in uh, a faceted browser, which allows you to find data sets of interest, and I'll tell you about that a bit in a minute, um, into a data warehouse called ModMine, and also it's being made available by two different um, uh, so-called cloud computing environments. So in terms of volume, um, there have been so far uh, 2,300 data sets that have been through that QC process and have been released. And somewhat, I think, to everybody's surprise, the final number is going to be more like 3,700. So when we, everybody moved towards the end of the project and had a sort of clean out of their data sets, we suddenly realized there was 1,400 more that needed to go through the pipeline. And uh, as the as the project progressed, data sets tended to get larger. So the, uh, the current release data volume is about six terabytes, but we're expecting 20 to 25 um, in total. And uh, that's really uh, more than you can comfortably carry around on a laptop. And so um, we're in the post-laptop era. I remember meeting somebody at a, uh, at a conference in the days when disk drives were smaller and they had the whole human genome on their laptop and it seemed very novel. Um, and it's a nuisance to download that volume of data as well. So inevitably what's going to happen is you're going to start moving computation to the data rather than the other way around. And um, that will happen both through Amazon freely um, uh, providing the data and uh, also there's a Bionimbus cloud that I'll tell you about as well. So the data will be available in a number of different ways as raw file depositions to the repositories GEO and SRA. So if you like, that's the crude, crude data. Um, worm-based and fly-based, the model organism databases for the, um, for the worm and fly communities will take the refined data from the modern code project, uh, but that will take them some time. And then everything's going to be available on, on the cloud and you'll be able to take computation to the data. So the front page, the portal that Elise mentioned um, is moderncode.org. And it has a number of different tools, uh, which I'll briefly skate through, starting with the data set search. So the data set search is a so-called faceted browser. And what this means is that without knowing what data we've produced, you can try and explore to discover what there is. So I don't know if you can read this, but for instance, there's a list of the organisms here. If we click on Melanogaster, the number of data sets that came from Drosophila 
is uh, 792. This is a bit out of date, of course. And if we were to select something else, for instance, transcription factor binding sites, that number drops further. So we're discovering that um, there are 87 data sets related to Drosophila and transcription factor binding sites. And as you select, make any selection, the other numbers adjust. So whereas it started out with a number of Drosophila uh, data sets being 792, that dropped as soon as one made a selection for the number of transcription factor binding sites. So there are many different categories that you can facet by. So if you want to know the output of a particular lab, you could open up the principal investigator one or which cell line or tissue, temperature, developmental stage. And so this is a good way of then exploring what is available. And in the process, it brings up a list of the possible data sets. You can tick them off and collect them into a little shopping basket. And having done that, you can do various other things like launch GBrowse to look at a genome browser, view them in ModMind the warehouse. You could download them, get a list of the download URLs if you want to do it in an automated fashion, or find out about where the data are on the cloud. So, uh, another way of accessing the data uh, is just plain old-fashioned FTP, where there's a big list of directories arranged by organism, and two files that you should uh, pay attention to, the manifest, which says what there is in the entire uh, project, everything that was produced, and the other is a metadata file that ca carries common metadata across all experiments. So if you want to find out roughly what the entire project did, that's perhaps the file to look at. And you can burrow down, as you'd expect, through C. elegans, transcription factors, into the parent directory of that, chip seek experiments to get right down to the data files that cover the entire genome for uh, this particular set of experiments. So um, back up to um, the, the, um, the top. If you were to, if you wanted to go straight into a genome browser where you're viewing the, the data presented across the individual genome, you could have done that through the faceted browser and then launching GBrowz, but sometimes it's useful to go in directly into, um, uh, directly into GBrowz, where there, again, you can select tracks in much the same way as I just described. So you could say you're interested in chromatin structure out of all tracks, and clicking on that would allow you to, for instance, choose histo modifications, and within that, chip seek experiments, and within that, you can then select individual experiments, uh, mouse over them to find out more details, and finally bring up GBrowz, where you can see the various different data tracks laid out across the genome. And because sometimes you want to compare and contrast particular types of data, you can save track combinations because it can, it, it can take a while to uh, set up the correct set of tracks. So now on to uh, ModMind, which is the, um, the data warehouse. And um, the, the Mod, ModMind is built on a, a platform called Intermine that makes it easy to integrate a, a large variety of different types of data and to perform flexible querying. And for the modern code project, there's been a number of different tools that are integrated into it, which I'll, I'll go through uh, some of them quite quickly. And so, for instance, one is there's a simple search. And for instance, if you're interested in ChIP-seq data sets, which were carried out on Lava, you could type in ChIP-seq and Lava. And, um, but equally well, you could type in lab head names or um, other, uh, other items of interest. And this will bring you up a list of submissions. And were you to select one of them, you can find out quite a lot of details about how, which you won't be able to read here, I'm afraid, which, about how the experiment was carried out and when, when and how much data were available. And there are a couple of things of note. One is off the bottom of the screen, which I'll come to next. But first, this green box, which allows you immediately to download uh, various data in various different common formats, like tab delimited or GFF, or sequences associated with the, the features that are annotated, or to find lists of genes or other things that overlap the binding sites that have been defined or find genes that are nearby to the binding sites by defined parameters. So these are things that people uh, often want to do with these types of data. Um, lower down the particular submission page is a big blue stripy area, which is kind of important. This was what the pain and suffering of collecting all the detailed metadata was about. Uh, and in principle, you can start at the top here and find out how the strain was grown and for instance, because this is a chip experiment, how the chromatin preps were done and how the chip was carried out, how the hybridizations were done, because this was a chip-chip experiment, um, on through how the uh, images were collected, how the data were normalized, and how the enriched regions were, were developed, uh, were, were, were extracted from those data. And the idea here is that if you end up using a particular modern code data set, you can uh, work out in great detail how it was in fact generated and each of these links here takes you to 
um, uh, and a corresponding wiki page where there's a detailed experimental protocol for, for how the step was, was carried out. So the hope and the idea is that in years to come, people can look at the data, scratch their heads, wonder, wonder what it really, how it's really produced, and backtrack through all of this in order to work out uh, really exactly what was done. Um, so another feature of uh, mod, uh, ModMine is that it works with um, lists of data. So for instance, um, it's often um, experiments nowadays produce lists of genes, and you can upload lists of genes into ModMine, uh, specifying, for instance, that you're lead, loading a uh, demalagaster gene set. And this then makes available for you a number of tools that um, uh, run on the fly. So for flies, anyway, not for worms, there's a, a developmental time course in a series of um, cell lines uh, gene expression list that's generated. And so this allows you quickly just to have a quick look-see to how, for instance, your favorite gene set varies or co-varies across, uh, a, for instance, a developmental time course. Uh, and there are other widgets, little tools, uh, for instance, for go term enrichment or publication enrichment. And publication enrichment is, well, you find a set of genes you're interested in, and if there's a publication that unexpectedly frequently cites that particular set of genes, uh, then it'll that'll come up at the top of the list. And that's a useful thing to do because you want to know about the papers that are citing the particular set of genes that you've, um, for instance, just pulled out in an experiment. Um, uh, another uh, tool that we've recently introduced is the genome region search. And in the genome region search, uh, you won't be able to read this, I'm afraid, but I'll describe what it is. You can upload a set of regions that you're interested in. So for instance, chromosome two positions, one million to one million and a few thousand and then select the types of data set, modern code data sets, that you would like to extract features from. And it will then, uh, for as many different chromosomal regions that you uh, provide, will provide you with the overlapping set of annotations. So this is a way of uh, uh, pulling out slices of modern code data corresponding to just to particular regions of the gene that you, that, that you like and are interested in. Um, so there are a number of other um, features that I don't have time to tell you about. So for instance, there's a, a, we have a thing called template queries or template searches whereby for uh, commonly uh, asked questions or common tasks are available as little um, web pages into which you can put a, uh, a gene or you can select a list of genes uh, and carry out searches with those. Um, and uh, there's viewers for the fly chromatin states and a link to the Park Lab viewer for those data. And also the um, uh, interactive regulatory uh, maps. So for instance, the science papers had a, a fly and a worm uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, um, transcription factor and microRNA maps. And uh, we uh, made uh, dynamic versions of those. So uh, for instance, you can mouse over a particular gene and, and highlight its, uh, its uh, regulatory targets. So finally, I want to um, turn quickly to the, um, uh, the cloud data. And so Amazon, as I mentioned before, will um, mount data sets that it believes are going to be useful to the public. And we've, uh, Lincoln Stein has managed to persuade them that modern code data will be useful. And they'll do that for, for free. And um, if you were to Google Amazon modern code data, then I think that within the top two or three hits, you'll get uh, this link here, which is the link to um, the uh, Amazon Web Services Browse by Category Academic Data Under Biology Modern Code or, um, Organism and Cyclopedia of DNA, DLA Elements Data. The moment that's about five terabytes loaded, as I said, it's going to go up with time. And the way things work is this. It's a pay-as-you-go. And the reason it's pay-as-you-go is modern code funding is for a limited amount of time, and therefore there's no way for us to pay to, um, to uh, provide the data to you uh, for the long-term future. But uh, you can load a, uh, at, you can mount an Amazon machine, an Amazon machine image, which is basically a computer with all of the data, all of the tools that I've just described on it. Um, and that then allows you to um, use all of those for as long as you like and then shut down your, uh, down your image. And if you'd like to do calculations, you can uh, you know, buy time on a thousand large machines and carry out big, big computations. You, you have the choices of mounting everything, tools and everything, or the GBRAS data or just the data. And um, the um, advantage of this is that we can make everything available in the long term and don't have to worry about system administration issues related to keeping you know, machines up to date. The, the Amazon takes care of all of that. 
Now, if you don't want to pay for the time being anyway, um, bionimbus.org has a similar environment and similar data, and as long as you register with them, you can get access to the data through Bionimbus, and they'll provide computational resources as well. So for, so for the time being, the most attractive option is probably to go there, but in due course, they'll, that, that will probably cease to exist, and then Amazon will be the, uh, the long-term home of the data. Um, so I've told you briefly about um, the Monocode project and how did data get in, the front end portal, faceting browsing, uh, finding data in the FTP site, the GBrowse, the data warehouse, various tools that were available, and the fact that all the data will end up in the cloud. And so not everything's on Amazon yet, but in the last year as we ramp everything down, the, uh, all the tools that I described are gonna be available as, a, as an Amazon machine image, and, and that, will be, that will be that. Uh, now, the only last thing I should mention is that uh, we have a help email address, help at modernco.org, and we like receiving emails, and we usually respond within 24 hours. Not always, but usually. And um, uh, in the future, there is going to be likely a joint Modern Code ENCODE data coordination center run by Mike Cherry, and I believe that they're probably going to keep responding to those emails as much as they can in the longer term. And I talk too fast. So. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so I'm happy to take a quick question. Actually, technically, I think I could have 13 minutes of questions, but uh, I'm sure I'm sure you won't do that. Uh, so I'm a basic scientist. I'm not a modern code person, and so I'm curious with these different. Um, uh, opportunities if there's a simple way to load in one's own personal data. One thing we are often doing is comparing to the modern code data. And yes. so I'm just wondering what the interface is between that, those kinds of data sets. So it depends exactly what you want to do. But for instance, if you were to go to GBrowse where you're viewing the data, and of course the human um, eyes and brains are one of the best image processors are out, out there. In GBrowse it's, in GBrowse, it's possible to upload your own tracks of data, and there's a variety of different very standard formats like the UCSC genome, genome browser that are acceptable, so BED and GFF and things like that. And so it shouldn't be a problem. If you have any difficulties, help at Modern Code. So I sort of have the opposite question. If, is there a way to um, <clears throat> incorporate analyses that uh, people are going to do from this moment forward, not just by uploading data, but, but also to capture the results of the analyses to... So, uh, the, so some of the um, data sets that the, modern, that the consortium has vetted and had um, uh, are released are, are in fact analysis or reanalysis data sets. And so yes, in theory, right now as we stand here, it's difficult to do that because we're ramping down we have a very large backlog of submissions to get through. Uh, as I said, we were all, all kind of surprised. And um, uh, so it, it's hard at this juncture, I think, to take on more data sets. And so what you're asking is in the long-term future, two years from now, how would one go about doing that? Well, I'm thinking about, you know, the hope is that this massive amount of data will be used by the flying worm and other communities. Um, and so it would be really great to be capturing that in the centralized site, which I'm hoping will be taken over by yes. code. So I was more thinking about not, not what we have left to do in the next year or half year. Or yes, I see, months, I see what you're saying. Well, I guess there's kind of two types of answers to that. One is that because we'll put everything up on the Amazon machine image, and that, and Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, in principle, that's gonna be the entire submission and processing pipelines. Anybody who wants to could rehydrate the entire um, data processing system and load in new submissions. But I think something slightly different will probably happen in practice, which is that the distillate, the conclusions from the, the, the experiments, maybe not all the detailed data on which it's supported will end up in worm base and fly base. And they're sort of mandated in the long term to curate and provide data to the communities. And we work with them closely already and are already passing off data. And Flybase has done a really nice job of, of for instance, displaying the expression data. So I think that may be um, um, a way forward. And I know that Flybase has been looking at, for instance, using Intermine as a way of maybe managing this scale of data, because up until now, I think, I'm, I'm not actually sure what the relative volumes of data are, but I believe the modern code data sets really are quite big. And so, um, uh, uh, 
it, it may be causing some head scratching on in um, the model organism databases as well and how to deal with them.